if you'll recall from our last lecture, uh, Art Nouveau was the movement that followed the aesthetics movement. Uh, remember, the precursor was the aesthetics movement, which um, depended on expressive quality of organic line, and also the arts and crafts movement with the graphics of people like William Morris that also em em emphasize the importance of this kind of um, stylized natural form. And different painters like Paul Gauguin and Toulouse-Lautrec were also inspired by those kind of linear patterns of the Japanese um, yukiue, the woodblock prints. And all of these came together to start to create this new movement that followed Art Nouveau, which created these undulating asymmetrical lines um, inspired by flower stalks and buds and tendrils of growth. And remember, it was uh, meant to signify growth uh, for this new century. So that spanned from about 1890 to 1910 in its heyday. And also things like dragonflies, insect wings, butterflies, all kinds of natural objects that were then stylized into these kind of rhythmic patterns and whip-like, um, what they call whiplash-like curves are uh, reflected in the graphic that you see here, this illustration by Alphonse Mucha. So we'll see again more examples of this idea of taking organic uh, line and linear rhythm and starting to use that not only in graphics art, but also in architecture, interior design, furniture design, and decorative arts. A key figure in the Art Nouveau movement working in Scotland is Scottish architect and designer Charles Rene Mackintosh, who specialized in predominantly geometric lines and his um, very emphasis on vertical um, graphic style had a huge influence to the Australian secessionist movement. Um, and so we'll see more of that coming up in this lecture today too. So if you'll recall the French Art Nouveau artists that we looked at previously, it's like Hector Guimard um, and Louis Majorelle, Alphonse Mucha, they were um, more embodying a very curvilinear kind of pattern. And so um, Macintosh is also going to work in the stylized patterns of nature, but making it much more um, perpendicular with strong emphasis on vertical lines. So here's Scottish architect and designer, Charles Rene Macintosh, work, um, who worked in Glasgow in collaboration with his wife and other two people um, who they called the four. And they created an international reputation in the 1890s uh, for their Art Nouveau posters, spaces, and furniture. So um, they're creating very light, elegant, and original furniture. In particular, the furniture was quite innovative. And they were also inspired by the Japanese design aesthetic, which greatly appealed to him. He, he liked the simple forms and the natural materials used in some of the Japanese um, designs. So he's going to use that as well as this idea of using positive and negative shape, um, light and dark, the idea of contrast um, to create pattern and ornament. And he was trying to um, create a calm organic feel that he was trying to interpret in a more linear way. So, okay, as the slide says, um, he regarded the space around and within the furniture to be as essential to the design as the furniture itself, meaning the negative space around the piece creates its own pattern visually. And so working with that idea of contrast, and we've talked before about how people are attracted to contrast and that, um, you know, is how we see right from the beginning as infants, we notice contrast uh, the most. So he's using that kind of, um, black lacquered effect that uh, the, some of the again Asian furniture uses to create that contrast in his furniture. While Macintosh was in design school at the Glasgow School of Art, he met Margaret MacDonald and his her sister Frances MacDonald and then Frances's husband Herbert McNair and they formed a group called The Four um, which they exhibited their work in Vienna under the term Glasgow style. And this greatly influenced Viennese Art Nouveau um, in around 1900. So 
the one of the philosophies they were embodying or they wanted to embody in their work was that they saw people as individuals versus designing for the masses. So um, they said people needed not to have a machine for living, but they were trying to create a work of art for people to live in. So they're trying to create the simplicity of Japanese forms using strong right angles um, and combining them with some floral motifs and subtle curves, like you can see on this slide. And um, all their major com commissions were between 1896 and 1906. So they had a very short window of time, but that made a big impact in what they did in that decade. As I mentioned in the previous slide, um, Margaret McDonald met Macintosh at the Glasgow School of Art, and they started, after they were married, started to collaborate um, with each other and with uh, her sister and her his sister's husband, Herbert McNair. But Margaret's contributions were typically um, some of the art pieces that were installed. So she was showing the uh, influence of the um, illustrator Aubrey Beardsley, who was another um, big figure in the aesthetics movement and Art Nouveau, but um, they were trying to create these sort of elongated figures that were um, devoid of things that were associated from the past. So she was kind of forging her own new style and this style had a great influence on the secessionists, Gustav Glimt and Joseph Hoffman. Uh, her work was exhibited in the 1900 Vienna Secession um, where again, that was seen by those artists and um, Joseph Hoffman being an architect and designer. And they were, uh, Macintosh and McDonald were very popular on the Viennese art scene. They both exhibited at um, the Viennese International Art Exhibition in 1909 as well. So um, she also collaborated with her husband on some of his important interior design commissions, such as the Willow Tea Room, which we'll see in a little bit. Macintosh was asked to design some uh, part of the building for the Glasgow Art School. And this is the facade that he designed in 1896, which is considered the first original example of Art Nouveau design in uh, architecture in the United Kingdom. By 1914, uh, he had ceased practicing any kind of architecture and design, and he had devoted himself entirely to watercolor painting. And he was work was really forgotten and received little attention until the late 20th century when people started to really appreciate his furniture uh, and from there his, the other designs that he did as well. In this slide by um, you know, one of the interior spaces of the Glasgow School of Art designed by Macintosh, you can see the influence of what they call baronial style, meaning he was taking ideas from the Scottish um, castles around him. And if you notice those kind of stylized hangings off the second floor balcony, um, that would relate to, you know, a tapestry that might have been hung in a great hall or some kind of heraldry. And this building, unfortunately, was heavily damaged and destroyed, actually, by fire in 2014. So um, this, you know, was we just have photos to, to see what it looked like. But he designed um, this architecture, the light fixtures and the furniture. And uh, unfortunately, again, it's no longer with us. These chairs designed for the art school in the late 1800s uh, show his emerging style with an iconic motif, and and one of the and that is those um, that block of the nine cubes that create that visual pattern of light and dark on the back splat of the chair. Um, we'll see that being repeated in other furniture that will be c coming up next. But just notice the clean, simple lines of the pieces, and that's going to be um, expanded upon in future designs as well. This is a more unusual piece of Macintosh furniture showing the quarter sawn oak in a more kind of craftsman or arts and crafts treatment. And then, uh, but then you can see again, the stylized plant forms and the strong perpendicular designs with the um, bowed curves, which are very iconically Macintosh graphics. Quick 
Queen's Cross Church, uh, built here in 1896 by Macintosh, was um, commissioned to um, be on this site that was quite difficult. It's a very narrow uh, strip of land that uh, he had to deal with. And so he was trying to um, work with this very tricky intersection of two roads on both sides. And so you can see the design's quite narrow. But the idea was to create, again, this nod toward the, Sp the Scottish castle and the Gothic style. So you can see that kind of turret at the top or the tower with the crenellations at the top. And then, you know, the Gothic window um, set into the church as well. So it was um, this inspired by the Scottish castles with those Gothic touches and now is the headquarters of the Macintosh Historical Society. One of his most iconic designs was the Hill House, and this is regarded as Macintosh's finest residential design. It's from 1904, and it's a mix of arts and crafts, Art Nouveau, uh, Japanese influence, and Scottish baronial style all coming together to create this unique blend. Um, and his wife helped design the textiles and some of the mantle surrounds, uh, fireplace surrounds in the tile. But Hill House was unique in that uh, Macintosh observed the lifestyle of the family. The family that lived here is called the Blackie family. Um, and he just observed their daily life and their daily habits. And so after he did his observation, he designed the home to accommodate their lifestyle and designed it from the inside out with this form follows function idea, which was quite unique for this time uh, before people would just build a building and humans were expected to adapt to the design. And so this was one of the first cases of an architect, uh, again, adapting the building to the owner's functions. And um, he was trying to minimize exterior, exterior design to enhance the impact of the interior. So the exterior is, you know, fairly plain and simple. You can see with the exterior design for Hill House, uh, there's this completely asymmetrical type of construction going on. So there's all these different uh, roof levels and shapes. You can see the tower inspiration again from the castles. And it was the idea of to keep the outside of the building quite plain and sober, looking very rectilinear. Um, so therefore, again, the inside would be emphasized and the feeling of the decor and the inside would then provide a um, nice, a sharp contrast to this very plain, unadorned exterior. This is um, a Portland cement uh, and was originally a sort of a soft gray color when it was first built. On the interior of the house, you can see this sort of combination of the masculine <clears throat> energy that the outside of the house is known for combined with more of a feminine energy with the uh, designs contributed by Margaret McDonald, such as the fireplace surround seen here and the art piece over the fireplace. Notice the built-ins um, hearkening back to the arts and crafts movement and then also the feeling that everything's <clears throat> placed very intentionally. As a matter of fact, Macintosh was so particular about that, he even dictated what kind of flowers could be placed on the dining room table. So the client had to buy those particular flowers for the interior of the house. In this slide, you can see some of the iconic Macintosh motifs, such as the stylized roses, and um, notice those stenciled up on the wall and also kind of indicated in the light fixtures that were created uh, by him for the house. And then also the kind of grid patterns and checkerboard motifs. So this idea again of combining masculine and feminine hard lines with soft lines, uh, black with white uh, is the overriding or overarching theme in this house, but in many of Macintosh's designs. Here we see the master bedroom that was quite unique for its time in that it's all white, uh, very stark interior, which uh, again was quite unique if you think back on the Victorian era bedrooms with the 
heavily carved headboard and footboard, the deep saturated colors, the wall cover, the fussy window treatments and bedding, uh, this pared down very clean look, uh, taking advantage of the natural light was very, uh, again, unprecedented. Then also notice the furniture. So he has the white lacquered work and the black lacquer work. And if you notice that ladder back chair with the black lacquer and the grid pattern at the top, that's Hill House chair number one, one of his iconic uh, masterpieces. And um, this room is also purported to be haunted. So I don't know, what do you think? Has a little bit of a creepy vibe to me. The Hill House chair number one seen here, notice the cacatoa shaped seat. And then the sense of humor in that the ladder back goes all the way down to the floor. So again, those um, rungs have no function there. It's just creating that rhythmic pattern. And then also the exaggerated tall vertical of the back, which is helping to fill up the negative space created between the corner and the wardrobe. This house that was designed in 1906, and again, you can see not built till late, 100 years later, was, or 90 years later, um, was for a design competition by a German magazine. And so the magazine asked for designers to create a house for an art lover. And these, um, unfortunately, because Macintosh got his sketches in late, he didn't win the prize from the magazine. And the uh, plans never were um, you know, built. Weren't, it wasn't intended to be a, an actual project. There was no client for it. But he was trying to go with some of those same concepts he was experimenting with Hill House, meaning having more of a plain exterior and then designing the interior uh, as a blend of masculine and feminine forms and creating a lot of abstraction in those forms. He was trying to have independent design, you know, away from what was expected of the day. And um, then the building, like I said, was built and now is a party venue. I guess people rent it out for weddings and so forth. These were some of the original renderings from the house. And of course, it was designed to be a residence. The current construction uses these rooms to house banquets and conferences, and there's a cafe and gift shop. So um, it's with the intent of Macintosh's design, but not the interior is not really designed by him, just based on these um, renderings and sketches he did for that original competition. These panels created by Margaret MacDonald uh, show that Japanese influence in the figure's faces and that vertical elongation and abstraction of the figure itself, which was said to have influenced, again, Vienna secessionist artists such as Gustav Glimt uh, after she exhibited these in uh, Vienna. So these are um, examples of her not really staying true to natural forms or academy style art with the emphasis on the uh, naturalistic human form. So you're taking the human form and um, making it iconic. So you can see like those kind of stylized eyes up in the corners of the piece as well. Another notable design uh, by Macintosh was a series of tea rooms that he created for a woman named Kate, a woman named Kate Cranston who was involved in the temperance movement, meaning she was trying to get drinking outlawed. And she was trying to create a place that people could socialize without having to go to a pub. So we know in the UK, pub culture is quite popular. Um, so the, have, the idea was to have an art, artful place for people to meet for tea. And between 1896 and 1917, he designed or restyled all four of these tea rooms with his wife as well collaborating with him. And they created the exterior, the interior, murals, furniture, the lead glass that you see here in the front. Um, some of the rooms have a more feminine aspect. So it's for women uh, to have tea and lunch. And then there were also things like billiard rooms with heavier, uh, darker furniture with leather that was meant to be more masculine uh, so that men would be attracted to come in and uh, play billiards and have a cup of tea without going to the pub. 
So they also designed the flatware, the tea services, the uniforms, and um, these all were designed to integrate with each other. So as, um, if you look on the next two slides, you'll see this decorative window in the facade of now the existing building with the jewelry store on the ground floor. The interior design that the um, Macintoshes created for these tea rooms, especially you can see in this room, created a fantasy for afternoon tea with the room that was intimate yet very um, colorful with the rich uh, purple and playing off the white and gray accents and featuring soft gray carpet, um, silk upholstered um, wall treatment, and then these high back chairs with the silver tinge to them. And the walls were painted a simple white, but they had a frieze of colored mirrored and leaded glass panels. And they also had a fireplace on the opposite wall that featured one of Margaret McDonald's gessos um, above it. So again, it was meant to be this um, stylistic Art Nouveau and a fantasy room. And it also gave women an opportunity to have a place to meet because it was considered um, you know, not proper for a woman to go to the pub by herself, but she could come out and have a cup of tea with friends. And this is uh, also exemplifying the freedoms that the women were starting to enjoy with the turn of the new century. This chair with its high back was the first time that Macintosh experimented with that trademark high back chair design. Um, and you can see, the, again, the play of the curves playing off the straight um, verticals. And um, this chair from 1897. So this is at the Argyle Street Tea Room where he had been hired to design the furniture and other people were involved in some of the interior details. And then after this one, um, he was able to design two more tea rooms for Miss Cranston. So. Um, this Argyle Street Tea Room chair is the precursor to the Hill House chair number three and some of the ones you saw in the previous slides. So when he was designing these willow tea rooms, the willow plant or the willow tree became a major motif and inspiration, as you can see in some of the details of the backs of the chairs. But this one was inspired by a type of woven chair that they call a living willow seat that you'll see on the next slide. Um, and it's still popular today. So you can see that demi lune shape <clears throat> and then the um, interlocking grid pattern that creates the back is inspired by the type of furniture people use where they take willow branches and weave them into these kinds of, um, it can be furniture, baskets, sculptural forms. You might've seen these, like they'll use these even for the base for wreaths around the holidays. Um, and so these willow branches were the inspiration for this particular set tea from the tea room. This slide really sums up the Macintosh style with the contrast of the white and the dark, the curve and the straight, the organic shapes that are stylized and made graphic, um, made from the willow plant. And then also notice the um, art piece by Margaret McDonald, which gives um, that shimmering gold into these kind of more stark colors. So it's this idea of layering, but in having this kind of simple geometry to the room as well that makes them um, something that really inspired people at the time. But then, like I said, Macintosh and his work uh, fell out of favor or just was not really thought about again until the 1980s when during the postmodern movement, people really started to appreciate um, the genius of Macintosh and started to reproduce his furniture and um, pay more attention to these designs from the turn of the 20th century.
The Vienna Secessionists were a group of Austrian artists who resigned from their academy. And this movement included painters, sculptors, and architects. So in other words, they seceded or left the conservative academy of the arts, and they were seeking to create um, a new way of being in art. They were tired of being um, told they had to paint, draw, or sculpt in a certain way. That was just all in a more classical nature, and they were seeking to draw in for or they did draw inspiration from people like William Morris and the arts and crafts movement, wanting to return to more handmade objects, using classical motifs, but more as allegory as a bridge from the past to the present. And then also um, designing with, you know, symmetry and repetition. Matt, like I said, Macintosh played a key role in some of their inspiration, as well as Japanese art, like the Japanese woodblock prints we've talked about a few other times. So let's take a look at this uh, movement in the Austrian arts, the secessionist movement. The secession house was designed by Joseph Albrecht, and he was seeking to create uh, a geometric form that was um, reducing the amount of decorative elements and kind of breaking away from the Art Nouveau style in that they, instead of having the curves and things that the earlier Art Nouveau styles embraced, they're trying to create this kind of cleaner geometric feel. But it has that golden um, sculpture on the top that's meant to be laurel leaves, a symbol for victory, as we know. And there's symbols that are in reference to the goddess Athena as the patron of the arts. But um, this has then lovingly now been nicknamed the Golden Cabbage Building because of um, that golden circle of laurel leaves on the, on the roof. But uh, the motto of the secessionists was to every age it's art and to every art it's freedom. And they were seeking to have freedom in creation and having a place they could uh, freely display what they wanted to without having to have academy approval. So this is what this building was um, intended to do is um, have a place for their exhibitions. The secessionists were seeking to unite the fine arts with applied arts and create a total work of art. So this idea um, really rejected the 19th century revivalism that we've seen, you know, the Gothic revival style, the Greek revival style, the Renaissance revival style. Uh, they were rejecting all that and also the mass produced items that were popular in the Victorian era and returning to this handmade, handcrafted look. They thought industrialization had caused moral decay moral decay in society. So they were trying to use Greek myths and symbols to embody new ideas. So for example, the Owls of Athena um, that you can see on the building and the Greek dramatic masks of the face of Medusa, some of those kinds of um, motifs are incorporated. Uh, you can also see the influence of Japanese art again to where having things kind of flattened bands of pattern and stylized and uh, all of these were iconic to their ideas of trying to create a new art form for the new century. Uh, the uh, Austrian symbolist painter Gustav Glimt who was a leader in the movement and he was his father was a gold engraver and um, his mother was a singer, so the family, unfortunately, was always living in poverty. So he and his brother, who were both, his brother also was a good artist, uh, ended up having to really support the family through their um, artwork. And luckily, Gustav, being so talented, attracted the notice of many wealthy patrons. Um, you can see in his work the influence of Japanese art. But also he took a fateful trip to Ravenna and saw the mosaics, the Byzantine mosaics at San Vitale. If you'll recall the ones with Justinian and Theodora. And this had a significant impact to his, um, what they call the golden phase of his work, which we'll see next. One of Glimp's famous paintings is the portrait of Adele Blockbauer. And this says one because he painted two different portraits of her. And this is the first of the two. And it's composed of gold and silver leaf applied to canvas and then uh, gessoed over so that, um, and then in the gold and silver is inscribed with different symbols. 
So you can see symbols that look kind of Egyptian, some from ancient Greece, and you know the the background and the geometric scheme of it sort of overrides the the woman's um, naturalism. So she becomes an icon. So if you kind of think of those Byzantine icon paintings, so that. Uh, mosaics of Justinian and Theodora had a profound effect on Glimt, and you can see that um, reflected in this very avant-garde painting for the time. Another thing about this painting, this was one of the ones that uh, the Nazis stole, and so after the war, this painting was on display in um, Vienna under the title Lady in Gold, and the family of Adele Blackbar had to sue the Austrian government to get the painting back. and. Um, it's a, there's a very interesting movie called Woman in Gold, if you're interested in that story. This painting that is arguably Glimpse's most famous, The Kiss, was exhibited <clears throat> at the height of his gold period between 1907 and 1908 under the title The Lovers, and uh, is depicting this couple embracing each other. And the um, you can see some of the influence of, of Art Nouveau style in this kind of the way the plants are depicted at the bottom and also some of the arts and crafts stylized plants. It also reminds me of kind of Murano glass from Venice uh, in some of the patterning of it. But um, these kinds of uh, motifs of embracing couples is a common theme for his paintings. The Kiss um, created quite a scandal at the time. People thought it was a bit racy. And um, anyway, this was the type of art that the secessionists sought to display is something that they wanted to uh, be able to freely portray what they felt uh, inside them versus having something dictated as either being tasteful or not tasteful. They wanted the freedom to create however they wanted to create. Here you see two pieces that a Glimt painted in 1909 and some of his later phase um, for Paula Stocklet in Brussels, Belgium. And these mosaics were, um, again, in his late period, depicting these kind of swirling trees of life, these standing female figures. And um, these are a part of the uh, decor for the interior of the dining room which we'll talk about in more detail in uh, slides coming up. This painting, Medicine, was from a series of paintings that Glimp did for the University of Vienna on the ceilings. They're also known as the faculty paintings. And they're a series of paintings that he did for the Great Hall there uh, between 1900 and 1907. So he did different themes such as philosophy, this one again, medicine and so forth. Um, at the time, they were thought to be, again, um, a bit pornographic. You can see the Art Nouveau influences in the form here. And as a matter of fact, Alphonse Mucha, that Art Nouveau artist had ex um, exhibited with the secessionist, he had been invited to Vienna to show his art. And you can see some of that kind of, um, Mucha influence, I believe, in this painting. Anyway, uh, after the SS took over Vienna, these paintings were moved and they were being stashed in um, a castle in Germany. And it's believed that retreating German SS forces set fire to this castle to prevent it from falling into enemy hands. And this um, this painting, these paintings were destroyed. There's no proof that that happened, so they could have been taken and. We don't know who has them now, but um, it was common for um, Adolf Hitler to have more modern types of artwork just ordered to be destroyed because he was a fan of more classical motifs in art. Colum and Mosier was another person in the secessionist movement who was working to create uh, household goods and also paintings, graphic arts, and stained glass for the movement. He worked, collaborated quite a bit with Joseph Hoffman and founded the Werner Werkstatt, which was a studio that was creating functional and aesthetically pleasing household goods. And these owls that are on the 
uh, Vienna Secessionist building with that laurel wreath were created by Mosier. One of the famous architects of the movement is Joseph Hoffman, who was born in 1870 in the Czech Republic and studied at Brno. And then in 1887, I uh, studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. And he was one of the founders of the secessionist movement. Uh, he was engaged in trying to create a total work of art. And um, this included using geometry and these kind of cubist themes in his work that uh, were pretty ahead of their time for their day. He was also a friend of Charles Rene Mackintosh. He took two trips to Scotland to visit Mackintosh and see some of his work and it's thought Mackintosh um, also influenced ultimately what Hoffman will become his mature style. In Joseph Hoffman's design for Sanatorium Perkestorf, or the Perkestorf Sanatorium, um, we see this advancement toward abstraction and away from the arts and crafts style. So you can really see the inspiration of the modernism starting to come forward in this design. This um, sanatorium was really more of a spa. So there was a mineral spring on the site and people would go there to um, take mineral baths, create, you know, have phys different physical therapy treatments and massage. Um, but mental illness was treated there, and he was seeking to create a um, facility really stripped of ornament, uh, really trying to create a very blank slate environment so that people with nervous disorders um, could have a calm, um, again, just sort of clean looking environment in order to uh, recover. The furniture for the sanatorium creates that same uh, contrast of black and white and the grid patterns that we noted in Macintosh. And again, it was meant to be, um, again, the, the clean lines and the ordered repetition were meant to be restful to the mind, body, and spirit. Although the chair doesn't look too comfortable for sitting in, uh, it, but the idea of the interior space that you could have seen on the previous slide was to um, have lines that were just restful to the eye. Speaking of comfort, uh, Hoffman also designed this chair for that project, the sits machine, or a machine for sitting, um, designed for the sanatorium under the Werner Works thought, um, that workshop for handcrafted goods, and um, working to in you know collaboration with the column and Mosier. Anyway, this was influenced by the Mosier uh, the Morris chair, excuse me, the Morris chair designed by Philip Webb. And they were taking rational forms um, suited to a machine and then trying to create a comfortable reclining back chair. So you can see those knobs allow the back to be reclined at different angles. And um, this is made from bent beech wood and sycamore with sycamore panels. So that bent beech wood technology that we saw with the tonette furniture used for the curves of the chair and then sycamore panels for the back and seat and the sides. Um, they have one of these at the Museum of Art up in LA, LA County Museum of Art. If you wanna see one for yourself, uh, it's kind of fun to see an, an actual one up close and personal. So once we can get out and about again, perhaps you can go to LA County Museum of Art and see it. Now we come to one of the more famous buildings from the secessionist movement, and that's Palace Stocklet, built from 1905 to 1911. Uh, this mansion was designed by Hoffman for the art lover Aldolf Stocklet, uh, who was quite wealthy. And so he wanted to abandon all styles that came before and create a truly modern building. And you can see here that um, the starkness is softened by these artistic windows that break the eave line of the house. So you can see how the windows come up above, you know, into the roof line, which was quite unique. Um, he was trying to use Art Nouveau ornamentation. So you can see that with the sculptures of the men up at the top. Um, he's really almost anticipating the Art Deco forms that we'll see coming forward in the 1920s, um, you know, by 
15 years or so. So he was trying to create a reformed, what he called a reformed interior uh, that just functions with um, minimalist decoration and uh, murals by Glimt. And we'll see the pictures of the inside soon. But the other notable thing about this design is that um, it's the functions dictating the style. So this is kind of, a, again, a, a precursor to the idea of form follows function. And it's also cited so that it takes advantage of the street, has a more formal aspect to the street side, and then this more intimate garden side toward the back. This is still owned by the Stocklet family. So you can see the exterior of the building, which is in Brussels, uh, Belgium, but um, it does, it's not open to the public. The interior really does reflect um, an Art Deco aesthetic that we will see coming up with these kind of chunky club chairs that have the angular uh, 45s, the use of the marbling on the wall. The onyx is, was a popular um, stone that was used during the time. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and because of its avant-garde uh, design aesthetic for the time. and. Uh, Notice the integration of the windows, the light fixtures, and the um, different furniture that was designed for the space was quite modern. So these kind of velvet club chairs again, and then you can see the leather club chair on the next slide um, were breaking into furniture that very similar to what we still use today now. The Stocklet Palace was the first residential project for the Wiener Werkstatt, the Vienna Workshops, co-founded by Hoffman and um, Coleman Mosier. And see, he and his colleagues designed every aspect of the mansion down to the door handles, the light fixtures. Um, and you can see the interior being pared down to have just the beauty of the, the stone and the murals by Glimt, um, everything kind of in its place. There's a lot of use of the marble paneling and the artwork um, and nothing extraneous other than that. Um, they were integrating different art artists like Glimt and they were also trying to create this idea for, um, you know, this kind of stately appearance, but it was also influenced by the operas of Richard Wagner and some of those themes were in it as well. So uh, it was trying to create a comfortable urban mansion and a country house at the same time for the family. The Prague chair designed in 1925 by Hoffman um, is a modern classic and almost an antique. In five years, it'll be 100 years old, so it'll be an antique. But uh, it still look, has these very flat, fresh, clean lines uh, that's still popular today. So again, that's what makes something a classic. They were mostly made in natural beach color, but they could also be found like this in a black lacquered finish. You can see in these chairs designed by Hoffman uh, under the title, under the Viennese workshops, the Wiener Werkstatt was one of the um, key organizations that started to develop modernism. So you can see this kind of um, transition with using traditional methods of manufacturing with very avant-garde aesthetics that um, this emphasis on complete artistic freedom really created a big output of different styles of design. And um, again, this stayed popular for, for decades. Um, this also forecasts the Art Deco movement and the international style movement. So they were ahead of their time um, with these designs from the Wiener Werkstatt. The issue with the Wiener Werkstatt was that they were trying to create a craft-based style of production and turning away from uh, industrial mass production. So most of their work was commissioned work um, created specifically for someone that would have been of means that could afford them uh, versus producing work that would be affordable for the masses. Um, so they're trying to treat their work as art objects versus utilitarian objects. And you can see that 
and the design here of the Kohler chair um, with these kind of decorative nail heads really wouldn't be probably too or you know comfortable for sitting on in the tufting, but uh, creates a very dramatic statement as an art piece, and that was really its intention. The Cubist chair by Hoffman uh, is considered a modern classic. So he um, really, again, anticipated modernism with this piece of furniture. It's a perfect example of his strict um, quadratic themes. As, as a matter of fact, he was known as Square Hoffman because he used cubes and squares so often. Um, it was designed to be on display at an international exhibition in Argentina. But there was also a chair that inspired later modernists, such as Le Corbusier, who we'll study next week. Uh, so these, this chair, again, is now an antique, but um, always a classic design. When we're talking about the Chicago School of Architecture, also called the Prairie School, uh, this house here that you see called the Charnley House <clears throat> is a prime example of it. This house was built in 1892 by Louis Sullivan, who is one of the big three of US architects, along with Frank Lloyd Wright, who was his employee. And Louis Sullivan was Frank Lloyd Wright's mentor in helping him develop a modernist style and also H.H. H. Richardson, who designed Trinity Church that we saw in previous classes. So uh, Louis Sullivan designing the Charnley House uh, here in 1892 really created the first modern uh, residential building in America. And indeed, he's often called the father of modernism because the building is stripped from any historical details. Now, one could argue there is a loggia there. Uh, you can see on the front of the building. You do have classical ideals in that the building is balanced with a vertical axis of symmetry um, and it's almost Palladian in that respect. But notice how there's no ornamentation or anything that was popular during that time period as far as what we call Beaux-Arts style, which was taking um, European design features and in, incorporating them into the design. So um, this again, this idea of this kind of geometric simplicity and using those strong horizontal lines that you see on the house are hallmarks of the Prairie School. And that is said to emulate the landscape in the Midwest. You know, this is based in Chicago. So if you think of all those grasslands or prairie in that area, um, those strong horizontal lines were meant to um, evoke that feeling. Here is Louise Sullivan who lived from 1856 to 1924. And um, he had studied architecture for one year at MIT. And he worked in a firm in Philadelphia, then another firm in Chicago. He studied for a year at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And he started to observe uh, that form follows function. So this is his famous quote. Um, it is the prevailing law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, and of the soul, that life is recognizable in its expression, that form ever follows function. This is the law. And so Louis Sullivan wrote that in an 1896 essay. And that means that design should um, you know, result from its purpose with the clarity of form and no unnecessary details, that there should be truth in its structure, truth in materials. And so these are some of the qualities that uh, will be embodied in these next designs we'll be seeing. Here you see what is called the first um, sky skyscraper. Not very big to our eyes now, but this was the first one, uh, the Wainwright Building in 1891. And Louis Sullivan is called the father of the modern, of the skyscraper and the father of modernism as well. So um, what enabled the building to reach bigger heights? Can you think, can you think of something that might have needed to be invented to make that practical? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Well, if you thought elevator, you were correct. Um, the Otis Elevator Company invented that way for people to get easily from one floor to another instead of having to hike up several flights of stairs. 
Also, this innovations in mass production of steel enabled the ability to bring the building to new heights. So by the mid 1880s, a steel skeleton was created to support the weight of buildings versus using wood construction. And this enabled more glass and more open floor space. You see some Beaux-Arts touches or even some Art Nouveau kind of feeling touches in Wright's um, details for the Wainwright building. So um, the Beaux-Arts architectural style again is this neoclassical style taught at that school in Paris, which um, heavily influenced the style of architecture in the US from 1880 to the 1880s until the 1920s. So it's this kind of mix of Roman, Italian, Renaissance, Baroque, um, having some French Gothic thrown in there, a little bit of Greek, using rusticated stone, statues of gods and goddesses, and using plant motifs as symbolism. Um, some of the people working in that style would be people like Richard Morris Hunt, and is designed for the breakers, for the Vanderbilts, like we saw. But if you'll notice on um, this, this one of his um, Sullivan's famous, what they call celery freezes. So he used the leaves of a celery stalk and stylized that in a kind of a swirling a geosh pattern that um, became one of his iconic motifs. And then if you look at the pilasters and some of the stylized geometric plant forms, you can see that sort of Art Nouveau influence as well. Another early skyscraper, this one uh, designed by Sullivan in uh, situated in Buffalo, New York, is notable because it they created four zones for purpose. So the lowest floor, the basement would include um, mechanical, mechan you know, mechanical systems and machinery for things like the elevator and the, the venting for the building. The second floor typically had some kind of a public space. So shops, for example, uh, could be a restaurant. The upper floors were the offices, and then the fourth floor housed the um, more elevator equipment for the like the hoists of the elevator and so forth. So this became a template that has been used still to this day. In Sullivan's buildings, you see this um, brick pattern with these very horizontal uh, lines of brick that you'll also see Frank Lloyd Wright use in a lot of his prairie style. Um, buildings as well. And this Van Allen building was unique. This was from a design that Sullivan did for a de um, department store in um, Clinton, Ohio. Oh, sorry, Iowa. Um, so there was apartments above and a department store on the, the lower floors. But what was unique about this one, it was planned around the interior space, again, which was unusual for that time. So um, because that created sort of a, an awkward rhythm on the front of the facade, um, Frank Lloyd, not right, sorry, not Frank Lloyd, right, Louis Sullivan applied these kind of uh, decorative celery stock looking things on the front, which again, if, if you're thinking form follows function, mm, not seeing it on this design. But anyway, um, these decorative mullions accentuate the height of the building and create um, a rhythmic pattern that helps balance the building visual, you know, visually. Now we get to um, what AIA, American Institute of Architects, has dubbed the greatest of the American architects. And again, one of the big three, along with Richardson and Sullivan. And that's Frank Lloyd Wright, who designed 11, what, 1,141 structures, 532 of which were completed. In it, and um, he's known for using what's called organic architecture. So he was trying to work with humanity um, being in harmony with the environment. And he created everything from offices, churches, skyscrapers, schools, hotels, museums, several residential projects, furniture, lighting, stained glass, a very prolific creator. Um, his mother actually decided when she was pregnant with him that he would grow up to build beautiful buildings. Maybe she had a premonition about that. So she decorated his nursery with engravings of English cathedrals and she brought him special building blocks that he played with as a kid that he said always helped his spatial reasoning skills. Um, so the, he, thought, he claimed playing with these blocks influenced his knowledge of design and building. As I said, after the great Chicago fire, there was this building boom going on in Chicago and 
Frank Lloyd Wright moved there to become a draftsman in the architectural firm Adler and Sullivan. And um, <clears throat> he, well, he worked for a different firm first, then in, in 1888, he started working for Sul Sullivan. And Sullivan really took Wright under his wing and gave him greater responsibility, but under the understanding that he would not do any outside work, um, that he would, all of his work would be produced under the company Adler and Sullivan. Well, Wright didn't hold true to that promise, um, and he was doing what he called bootleg houses, which was breaking. He had a five-year contract with Adler and Sullivan, and by doing these this side work, he broke that contract, which caused a big falling out between him and his mentor, Sullivan. But um, it was thought that, as you could see that um, house you saw on the very first slide, the, this influence of Sullivan stayed with Wright throughout his life and starting to shape him as a modernist. Um, Frank had, Lloyd Wright had turned out an offer to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts because he felt like classical architecture lacked creativity. So um, he had a young family to support. So he just was working furiously. So by 1901, Wright had completed about 50 projects and he had um, employed about seven drafts people, five men and two women. And he was using these kinds of prairie style um, houses. So this early bootleg house you can see has this um, strong prominent cross gable which is a nod to almost like a Tudor revival style but again using it more as a geometric form versus um, you know what that that form originally had been um, intended for in that Tudor time period. Here we see right at toward the end of his life. And you can see he had a very long one, 92 years old. Um, but Taliesin, the word you're seeing here, was his home in Wisconsin. Um, it's it's an 800 acre agricultural estate. And um, the name Taliesin is Welsh, for, which means shining brow. And um, his ancestry was Welsh, so he named it in that honor of that. But um, it was his laboratory for organic ar architecture. and. Uh, he had a workshop here and then he built another one, Taliesin West, that's located just outside of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So um, let's take a closer look at some of his iconic designs. In this design, you can see some of the um, feeling of the craftsman style with the large eaves of the house. And again, the prairie school where you see those strong horizontal bands of brick uh, creating those horizontal emphasis in the design. And then notice the um, covered as kind of sleeping porch areas like we saw with green and green in the gamble house. Right also, um, this particular front door is featured. Oftentimes we'll see with the Roby house, for example, he would hide the front door, which was unusual. Uh, most times the front door becomes kind of a focal point of the house, but he tended to de-emphasize the entrance ways. You can see Wright experimenting with kind of craftsman style furniture and this chair that was inspired by the chair reclining chair of Gustav Stickley, which was inspired by the reclining chair of William Morris, the Morris chair. So again, this has that adjustable back and notice the quarter sawn oak and just the solid uh, straight lines of the piece that were more in this kind of craftsman style, which we reflected Wright's early years in design. Okay, here we see a rendering of his unity temple. And Wright was a lifelong Unitarian. And here he says, I ceased to be an architect of structure and became an architect of space. Many consider it the first modern building um, because it's made with reinforced concrete and um, it challenged and refined ideas about religious architecture. So he was he had a relatively small budget and um, which pushed him to using concrete as a cost effective choice, um, but it resulted in this kind of cube shape and the use of space within the sanctuary, again, around um, using that plus the rich wood and stained glass uh, shows the idea of a perfectly proportioned space that creates that sense of tranquility. So he really uh, elevated what he thought the sense of space was with his design of the sanctuary.
Here we see Wright's design for the Roby House, which is considered the icon of prairie style with those strong horizontal lines and cantilevers. Um, it's considered his best example of prairie style. And uh, notice the low pitched roof, the use of the positive and negative space um, with the cantilevers, the long bands of windows um, using natural materials of brick and stone. And this was also unique because it was a steel framed construction. So again, that was unusual for residential designs of the time. The home's main living space is an open living dining room with a central chimney, and that's considered one of Wright's greatest expressions of his early style. So also the interesting windows from the house that he designed, the custom light fixtures and furniture, all were meant to um, create one coordinated work of art. Uh, it's, again, the cantilevering of the plains, playing off the Roman bricks, uh, recall those endless horizons of open Midwest landscape. During, uh, during these early years of Wright's design work, uh, you can see his influence of the craftsman movement reflected in the furniture. So uh, you can see this straight kind of severe lines, rectilinear forms, the use of oak, and um, these types of forms stayed you know, with Wright's designs for, for a couple decades. Um, he began designing furniture for his own home in Oak Park, uh, including built-in window seats and, 2D st and sturdy oak armchairs. And you can see that designs of William Morris reflected in that reclining chair that we passed by uh, earlier in the slides. There are also, um, you know, these kind of dining tables you can see with these eight high back chairs and um, were very, you know, revolutionary looking for their time. They don't look like anything too special to our eye now, but at the time they were very, very different than what had been popular. Uh, the, firmer, the furniture forms kind of a, another barrier in the room, kind of a secondary space, if you will, with those high backs. And then also notice the very low ceiling. Wright was quite short and he preferred a lower ceiling uh, to make the interior almost cave-like. Um, the interiors were also really enriched by the use of lighting and wall sconces and leaded glass um, lamps like you'll see on the next slide. <clears throat> so using oak and bronze materials uh, were also materials that Wright integrated quite a bit in his interiors. You can see in this detail for the house lamp from the Roby house, um, the art glass that he made using the 30 and 60 degree angles. And he preferred those six, 30, 60 degree angles. It was made to be set on a library table. And there was 174 art glass windows throughout the house. Um, this house is considered one of the 10 houses that changed America. It was voted that by the AIA. So a very significant design. One of Wright's early commercial spaces was the Larkin Building. That's 76 feet tall with an interior courtyard that is um, like a central atrium with a skylight, which again was quite innovative. There's other technical innovations such as glass doors and air conditioning, radiant heat coming from the floor, built-in furniture. And he turned the building in on itself because it was located near some um, freight yards and he wanted to protect the employees from the coal pollution from the trains because it was sited right near the railroad tracks. So again, it's based around a Roman atrium with um, these kind of interior surrounding balconies facing that interior courtyard. And um, another innovation that Wright did is he had suspended toilet bowls in the public restrooms for easier uh, cleanliness. And so again, that's something that became a standard in office building restrooms. Um, but this is the Larkin building from 1904. Although Thomas Jefferson is credited with inventing the first swivel chair, this is Wright's version of one for an office space. So you can see the metal, um, these are the metal of the grids like we saw with the Macintosh designs at Art Nouveau and then the casters so that it was able to be rolled around. So this is an early iteration of the type of office furniture we still use today. Moving into Frank Lloyd Wright's next design phase, which is considered his 
Art Deco period or Mayan Revival style period, um, he was influenced and inspired by the Mesoamerican cultures, especially the Mayans and these types of temples that look like they rose organically from the ground and then now are eroding back to the ground. So he was very engaged in organic process with his work and that was exemplified in the ruins themselves uh, that again felt like they were so um, in process, you know, <laughs> like not in the process of, of decay back, back to the earth. So you can see Wright's uh, Mayan revival style embodied in the Imperial Hotel that he designed in Japan. Um, it was first created, there was a hotel on this site here in the 1880s, um, and it was used for visitors, uh, Westerners to be accommodated, um, and it was located just south of the Imperial Palace. So it was a, quite a large structure. Wright designed it to be in the shape of an IH for an Imperial Hotel, and um, he designed it so well that there was a huge earthquake in 1923, a 7.9 on the Richter scale, and the hotel is located on alluvial mudplain, which usually means there would be quite a bit of damage from liquefaction of the earth, but there was um, very little damage to the hotel. Because Wright was also a, quite a brilliant engineer, and so a lot of his buildings are notable for almost being impossible to, to destroy. Once people want to uh, dismantle them, they've had a difficult time taking them down. So again, this was all part of that um, st effort to make the building look like it was naturally part of the land and the landscape. So I mentioned earlier, Wright had been an avid collector of Japanese woodblock prints, and he'd very much been intrigued by Japanese culture for quite some time. So he jumped at the opportunity to create this hotel and um, it was meant to signal Japan's uh, update to more modern style displaying ties to the West. So um, Wright's really trying to create a hybrid of Japanese and Western culture, which you can kind of see in this slide. And the um, scheme included, you know, a lot of carved wood and so forth. So they're using skilled carvers and a lot of um, Mayan revival style using some of the Japanese volcanic stone also can see there on the fireplace and um, these kind of mix of the east and west is reflected in the different designs for this for the spaces there were peacocks roaming the grounds of the hotel and so use those as an inspiration for what they call the peacock chair uh, you can see that uh, back splat design is based on the eye of the peacock feather and then those long uh, those three long pieces that connect the back splat to the stretcher of the chair are the feather, you know, of the male peacock. Um, <clears throat> you can also see the structure of the lobby reflected from the slide brush before this, reflected in the design of the legs of the chair. So you can see some of those patterns that he uses and um, those motifs that are meant to harmonize and link throughout the design, throughout all of his designs, actually. The Hollyhock House that Wright designed for uh, Hollywood, California, um, was one of the earliest examples of a Mayan revival style. And it's a style that grew in popularity through the 1920s and 30s. Um, and he used these kind of inspiration again from the Mesoamerican pyramids um, to inform the design of this particular house. But it also shows his use of what we call textile blocks. So they're basically using um, reinforced concrete and using uh, rebar or reinforced bars um, to help these textile blocks stack. And these terraces that you can see also help connect the structure to the surrounding landscape. So just like the Mayan ruins themselves, the desire was for it to look like the structure grew naturally from the site and then will return naturally back to it. So using Portland cement and decomposed granite pressed into metal molds was the way he was trying to achieve that effect. When you look at the actual Mayan temple details and these kind of interlocking uh, geometric patterns, you can see the inspiration for Wright's concrete uh, textile blocks. 
that I uh, mentioned in previous slides. So um, the one on the hollyhock house has stylized hollyhocks, which was the client's favorite flower. Um, but then if you look on the next couple slides with the um, store house and the Innes house, you'll see different types of patterns in those textile blocks based on these Mayan patterns. By using these uh, textile block construction, like you can see here with the fireplace, Wright was hoping he could create more uh, affordable and accessible building methods. So they were trying, he was trying to create, um, you know, more elevated housing for people at an affordable price. And um, the result here in this particular um, building, the storehouse, which was created for a Wisconsin physician. Again, he was working on that Mayan uh, inspiration and also experimenting with, uh, again, these kind of building blocks to assemble to create different um, things like the fireplace seen here. The last and largest of the concrete block homes that Wright designed is the Innes House. Um, and he was, um, again, using that designs based on an actual Mayan temple. But you can see the way that the house ages is very reminiscent of the Mayan ruins themselves. So that concrete just being out in the weather starts to discolor and look weathered like it is going to erode back into the landscape. Okay, fast forward to the next decade and Wright is working in a new style, which is called Streamline Modern. It's part of the Art Deco movement and it's based on modes of transportation. So these kind of swooping linear curves uh, that you can see were based on things like uh, new airplanes and trains and automobiles that were um, being produced during this time. So the um, curves play off an earthy material, the Cherokee red brick with a pink mortar that Wright preferred. Um, and then there's going to be co concrete floors, uh, white stone, and what we call dendiform columns, which are tree-like, which were quite unique. So let's take a look at the interior of this particular building. So creating this sort of forest-like atmosphere with these dendiform columns uh, was hoping to create a message that all were equal. Uh, no one should have their own office. No one should have more or less privacy. It was more of a democratic ideal of the American dream. So these, um, as if anyone's worked in an open office space, it's really more of a nightmare, a lot of noise and um, distraction. But anyway, they did see productivity go up 25% working in this um, kind of open office space mode, and that became a template for a lot of offices to come. When you look at the dendiform columns, the billing department was very leery about these. So they made him create a test column because these are made from rebar and reinforced concrete. And they finally loaded down the upper lily pad with about 60 tons of weight and it was still standing. So finally the building inspector said, okay, yeah, you, you can build these. But uh, again, this is another example of Wright experimenting with those same materials, the reinforced concrete and the rebar that he used with the textile block houses, but in this new streamlined way. Here you see him experimenting with new forms of office furniture. Um, and he start, these were starting to be manufactured by Steelcase, which was a company that produced office furniture and open office systems for centuries that, or decades after this. Uh, anyway, they were um, originally intended to be three-legged stools. Wright thought that that would increase productivity. And um, the, the company owners were quite leery of the three-legged stool idea. So Wright sat in one and started to tip over and he said, oh, okay, I'll design something else. <laughs> so he designed this kind of funky metal uh, rolling chair. That was the office chair. And then you can see on the next slide, the desk, um, open office desk that went with that, with those same kind of streamlined curves on the desk.
And now we get into Wright's mature style, which includes houses like Gray Cliff, Antalias, and West. But the most famous example is this house, Falling Water, which is arguably one of the most famous homes of the 20th century um, because of its striking use of um, the waterfall or being built directly over a waterfall um, in this place, in this case, in Mill Run, Pennsylvania. So um, known for its concrete horizontals, limestone verticals, and again, the site uh, overlooking the waterfall. Now, originally when the Kaufmans took right to the site, uh, this was a place they liked to go and picnic. They had envisioned a home that would be sitting across looking at the waterfall. And so they went away, uh, they showed right the side and he walked in and he took notes and all this stuff so forth he noticed those two ledges of rock running perpendicular to each other and um, with that upper ledge having that overhang or the ledge of the waterfall having that overhang so uh, he used this as the basis for his design so what was an interesting story about it is that he went back to his studio at Taliesin in Wisconsin he touched no pen to paper for months and then finally uh, Kaufman called him and said, I'm about two hours away from you. I want to come see my house. And so Wright's uh, drafts people were going, hmm, I wonder what he's going to do. He doesn't have a house. Uh, but after Wright hung up the phone, <clears throat> he said, hand me my flimsy and my pens. And you'll see the rendering that he did uh, in the next two hours before the client arrived. So what happened is he had basically had designed the whole house in his mind's eye. And then once he put pen to paper, we see this famous and striking silhouette, uh, which became a career defining moment for him and really propelled his career for the next decades to the end of his life. So you can see Wright's using the limestone from the site to create the verticals. And then he has the reinforced concrete terraces that cascade down in a visual rhythm like the water itself. Um, one notable thing is that the way Wright had designed it, the contractor wasn't <clears throat> convinced that those cantilevers would work. So the, cantile the contractor actually put in more rebar into the cantilevers, which actually ironically caused them to sag a bit. And Wright had said if he would have stuck with his original plan, that wouldn't have happened. Um, but again, he wanted Wright wanted the homeowners to have a relationship and actually live with the waterfall, not just observe it. So you can see that in the design on the next slide of the interior, which we'll talk about next. So notice the rocks from the site are incorporated into the floor, or in other words, the floor is built around those existing rocks that have, were on the site. And uh, Wright wanted this the stone floor to be polished to reflect the surface of the water so that the floor becomes the water and then we still have those stone elements uh, reflecting again the actual construction of the waterfall itself. The interior is also famous for its um, clutter-free expanses and notice how Wright did all these built-ins um, and so that everything had its place. So you would, people say you don't want to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house if you like to move furniture around because everything's designed to be placed and actually built in to be placed in certain locations. So again, the idea was to have this um, clutter-free expanse that collected or created a visual flow between the interior and the landscape and just created an uninterrupted feeling of the tranquility of the landscape in the interior. In Wright's later design career, he did some masterpieces like this one, the Guggenheim Museum on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Uh, Solomon Guggenheim needed a place to display his collection of impressionist, post-impressionist, and modern art, and Wright conceived a building as a temple of the spirit. So it took him over 600, up to 700 sketches. Uh, the work was commissioned in 1943 and it wasn't completed until 1959 after Wright's death. But again, as far as design goes, I know we often don't have the luxury of time anymore like that, but you know, it's a process. So the design itself reflects that organic process and um, it took again over 
all those sketches and over six sets of working drawings to really realize this vision. But his vision was to have it like a Nautilus shell. So you would slowly ascend up uh, to see the art. And there's a skylighted atrium in the middle, which uh, helps illuminate the artwork as you work your way through uh, these ramped um, galleries. And so it was quite unusual for the time. And it was heavily criticized at the time too, because it was um, you know, thought to be an unusual way to view art, very different than a typical museum experience. Now you might have noticed on that last slide that the Guggenheim is actually white and in the sketch Frank Lloyd Wright shows it in that kind of pink tone that you see here at Greater Gamage Concert Hall on the campus of ASU in Phoenix. Um, this, that kind of soft Cherokee red was Wright's preferred color, um, but Guggenheim wanted the museum to have more of a modern aesthetic with the white. So um, Wright didn't win that argument. <laughs> anyway, this is Grady Gamage Concert Hall um, in Phoenix. Again, that was completed after his death, um, obviously designed while he was alive, but then completed from his plans after his death. And finally, we see Wright's design for the Marin County Civic Center from 1962, another building that was completed after his death. Um, he wanted this to reflect the California landscape, and he thought Marin County, which is one of the most beautiful places in California, which it is, uh, he considered it to be quite stunning there. So he wanted the landscape um, to look more beautiful because of the building, that the building would enhance the beauty of the landscape. The roof was originally supposed to be gold to match the color of the nearby hills, but they couldn't find a truly matching color. So um, they left it the color that you see here. The interior is notable for having these large atriums and um, that feeling again of connecting the outside and to the inside and also turning the view inward to the light. Um, so you can see that, of course, nature inspired Wright throughout his career. And uh, if you will read the next slide, you can see that that really formed the basis of his design inspiration. So Art Deco style is what we'll be talking about next. And this style really started in France in the mid to late 1910s and was popular all the way through to about the start of World War II. Um, this phrase, Art Deco, was coined um, because of an exhibition again, the Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs, um, that was in Paris in 1925, and that got shortened to Art Deco from that Art Décoratif. So um, we'll take a look and see what makes Art Deco Art Deco next. Some of the factors that inspired the movement was the embrace of technology. So versus Art Nouveau's emphasis on organic forms and that kind of linear flow and whiplash curves, Art Deco emphasized more symmetry and kind of a machine age aesthetic. So they're putting their faith in technology, you know, different than the arts and crafts movement who are rejecting technology. This was an, um, celebrating the new technologies with the style that was really associated with kind of a luxury lifestyle and a very glamorous one. So Le Corbusier, a modernist that we'll talk about next class, was the first person that used that term Art Deco because of that World's Fair in Paris and the title of it. Um, and let's take a look at some of the motifs that are embodied within the style next. Influences in Art Deco are very wide and varied. Um, international travel became more affordable. And so we'll see uh, Deco influences for different motifs from other cultures. This idea of futurism. So this idea of what are things going to look like in the future? So sort of robotic kind of forms. Uh, new forms of transportation very much influence the style, such as automobiles and new types of buses and trains and so forth. Um, they were also very much influenced by art movements such as cubism and uh, constructivism. They're also influenced by other kinds of uh, 
like I said, modern materials themselves, such as chrome, stainless steel, and a new type of plastic called Bakelite, and even Asian influences, bringing in lacquer work and things of that nature. So um, there was, like I said, very wide and varied influences, and some key designers are listed here, which we'll talk about during this section of the lecture. So as I said, this uh, Art Deco was a time of revivalism, and some of the famous forms of revivalism was Egyptian revivalism, really sparked by the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb by Howard Carter in 1922. So there came a, a big craze in Egyptian style, um, having Greco-Roman aspects and using Greek and Roman mythology as inspiration for some of the motifs. Uh, we'll see these kind of stepped pyramid forms that were inspired by not only um, Mesoamerican cultures, but also uh, Middle Eastern cultures and Spanish revivalism. So you can see examples of Art Deco Spanish here in California in this kind of Hispano-Moorish revival style. And then uh, French Empire and African art. So there is a big exhibit of African art going on in Paris during this time as the French Empire started to expand into Africa. So let's take a look at how that might have influenced some of the styles we're seeing next. So as I mentioned on the end of the previous slide, the African artisans were a big inspiration to the French Art Deco designers and the French artists and Spanish in the case of Picasso. So um, again, they greatly influenced the styles going on. If you notice the stylized face of the mask and the kind of the geometric form of the braiding in the hair um, were typical to this Art Deco style of kind of a stylized uh, geometric look to objects. Um, Picasso's style of painting, you can see based on his portrait here, was said to have been influenced by viewing these Af this African art. One of the artists that also had a big impact to this time period was Erte, who was a Russian-born French artist. He moved to Paris in 1910 to 1912 in that time period to become a designer. And um, unlike the rest of his family, his family, all, he came from a long line of Russian military officers or naval officers. And his father wanted him to pursue that career path, but Erte had other things in mind. So he moved to Paris, he started designing costumes, jewelry and graphics and then these kind of fashion plates like you see here as well as interiors and set design and he had a huge influence in all these areas but one of the things that was highly influential was his Harper's Bazaar magazine covers. He um, created over 200 covers for that magazine and this kind of art deco style which greatly celebrated this sort of sense of glamour and um, you can see embodied in this image. He lived to be 97 years old, so he had a, a long prolific career and influence. So these are some of Erte's Harper's Bazaar covers. If you've ever seen an old like Fred Astaire movie with the gentleman wearing uh, ties and tails, the white tie and, and tails with the top hat, uh, that was very much in keeping with this kind of art deco modern style and um, you know the women's kind of that flapper aesthetic that um, was embodied by some of the fashion designs of Coco Chanel. You can see fashions are changing to allow women a lot more freedom. The skirts shorten so they can finally move their legs without dragging skirts uh, through the ground along the ground and um, you know an uncorseted figure shape. You can also see those frozen details. So this idea of, of frozen movement kind of embodied on the curves of the one's uh, dress would be an example of that. And uh, again, this was reflecting this new trend. Women cut their hair short, um, just trying to, after World War I, it was considered a breakdown of the world order. And it was another time to kind of reflect and reinvent ourselves as society in uh, the West. So, um, these kinds of trends to modernize were um, very much in demand. So 
So hopefully you notice the ziggurat shapes on the Coco Chanel uh, flapper dress. And you can see those kind of, um, again, Greek mythology with the, the Pegasus on the Erte rendering for his theater design. And then you can see the ziggurat shape here in the backdrop uh, for the set design for this movie. As, long, as well as in the sconces or the light fixtures. Yeah. Notice the chairs have that kind of um, Joseph Hoffman aesthetic. This is pared down um, modern uh, chic look. And this was meant to be the height of fashion in the 1920s. Movies were hugely popular during this time period and also inspired this vision that people had of, of glamour and the new age. Um, and so even with the silent movies of the 1920s and actors like Rudolph, Rudolph Valentino, and then moving into the 1930s um, with talkies and people like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers embodying that glamorous lifestyle in the aesthetic. This is also known as the jazz age, the 1920s, where African-American artists began employing new styles of music and dance and new musical techniques, uh, having some African traditions within the musical style. Um, it was also the time of the Harlem Renaissance with a big flourishing of culture in that area. Uh, jazz became so popular that uh, it spread all through America, all through Western Europe, and it really started to create a bridge between cultures. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the author, was the person that coined the, word, the term jazz age for the 1920s, but it's embodied with the music of Louis Armstrong, who with his improvised solos, uh, Duke Ellington with his jazz orchestra playing in places like the Cotton Club in New York City, and he also toured all around Europe, and Josephine Baker, who was a Paris cabaret performer. The, a lot of the um, African-American artists played in Paris because they didn't re face the Jim Crow laws and the restri social restrictions that they had, unfortunately back in the States. Cigarettes, unfortunately, also became associated as a glamorous um, accessory item. So you can see this woman smoking with this very long cigarette holder. And so there was furniture design specifically for cigarette smoking, different types of cigarette tables, and also decorative boxes for um, holding cigarettes and cigars. Decorative ashtrays were all very popular during this time period. You might recall that I said Elsie DeWolf had introduced the idea of the cocktail party into society instead of having a dinner party. And um, cocktail parties became quite popular, but it was also the time of prohibition in the United States. So there was, um, in the States anyway, there was bootleg alcohol going on. And so there were these kind of cabinets that were meant to store alcohol. And this actually is a French version of a bar by um, Emile Jacques Ruhlman, who's one of the lead Art Deco French designers. And uh, you can see in those geometric rhythmic patterns on the front using exotic woods, wood veneers offset with uh, stainless steel is the aesthetic for the Art Deco period. So you just saw these frozen fountains or frozen water features and these kind of chevrons. Um, you can see in the bottom of these door panels and also these stylized kind of goddess figures all were motifs that were commonly used um, in the period. As I mentioned earlier, new modes of transportation were being made available <clears throat> such as Greyhound buses instead of having to have people take the train, which had uh, maybe more limited routes and schedules, these buses were starting to be made available for the public. And notice the streamed uh, stainless steel look on the side and that kind of feeling of the, the frozen movement reflected in the radiator cap of the next slide. So perhaps you can see some of that frozen mov movement idea uh, reflected in the design of Empire Diner, which is a New York City 
a landmark that was built in 1946 um, for the Fordero Dining Car Company. And um, you can see it has a stylized Empire State Building on its roof, but um, it's the embodiment of that kind of streamlined uh, sense of motion in the deco style. So you can see car designs of the time were getting quite extreme. This one from uh, the early 1930s uh, with this very exaggerated profile. And notice how that gets embodied in our first uh, iconic piece of furniture from the deco period you'll see next. So this is the speed armchair designed by Paul Frankel from 1933. And you can see the swoop of the arm uh, is mimicking the swoop of that large automobile hood. Um, and again, that kind of arc is implying that sense of movement. So this is the um, type of furniture that we start to see, which again, looks very tame to our eyes, but it was quite modern for the time, considering if you can think back on some of the things like the Art Deco, uh, sorry, the Art Nouveau furniture and the uh, Victorian Revivalist furniture that had been popular um, for you know the decades just before this. In this Art Deco poster, you can see this celebration of these new modes of transportation, being able to get um, to a vacation spot much easier and more affordably, in this case by rail, um, was something that opened up possibilities for people to experience new environments and see new sites at a more affordable price than was available in the past. So um, the idea of travel became something that the masses could do instead of just the elite. There were, however, these luxury liners where, uh, you know, that people traveled in lots of um, beautiful living conditions. And these liners were sent to really inspire people like Le Corbusier, who love their um, kind of aesthetic of these deco uh, liners that were traversing the Atlantic at the time. So you can see this one went from um, France to England to New York. And um, we'll see on the next slide the Art Deco menu for the SS Lurling, which was the one that went from San Francisco to Hawaii. You can see these kind of uh, stylized Hawaiian figures on the next uh, slide. So travel by airship or Zeppelin was something that was actually done between 1909 to 1937. And that top spire on the Chrysler building was actually intended to be a docking port for the Zeppelin. Um, and that seems really scary to me, but anyway, uh, they, unfortunately, this uh, whole trend ended with tragedy with the um, explosion and fire on the Hindenburg. So um, that put an end to people desiring to travel in that fashion. When Charles Lindbergh flew solo across the Atlantic in 1927, this created an international sensation. And um, this started to open up the idea that air flight could be made uh, more affordable and more readily available to uh, you know, people other than just specialty pilots and so forth. So um, again, this started to open up this whole idea of the world being connected and uh, very similar to when the astronauts went up and saw the earth for the first time from space and they realized it's all one, there's no countries, there's no borders, it's all one thing, right? Um, when Charles Lindbergh flew, again, this kind of sparked the public's imagination to realize that we could be more closely connected than we ever imagined. So now when we look at that, those modes of travel, we see those embodied in this Art Deco masterpiece, the, Art, the Chrysler Building, uh, designed in 1930 by William Van Allen on 42nd Street in Lexington in New York. And it was the world's tallest building for 11 months. They got to hold that title until the Empire State Building eclipsed it in 1931 but they're both Art Deco style. Um, this was the Chrysler Automobile headquarters. So you can see 
the reference to the hubcaps here on the kind of radiating star patterns going up to the top. And you can also see on that one floor, the eagles that were meant to look like hood ornaments jutting off um, on the corners of the building. Okay, so this was the first man-made structure of steel, or the first man-made structure that surpassed 1,000 feet tall and again made from steel um, structures or st steel framing is the word I'm looking for. Thanks. The elevator doors in the Chrysler building embody that Egyptian revival style with this stylized papyrus motif. And these kind of colors were quite popular. Um, onyx, that stone, um, it has a lot of these kinds of orange tones and golds and reds, was one of the stones that was in high demand for the Art Deco style. So when we look at Radio City Music Hall, a lot of the things we've discussed come together as a design, as an Art Deco masterpiece, really, uh, it, from this design from 1932. So this was designed by architects Edward Durrell Stone and Donald Desky and Raymond Hood. But Donald Desky did much of the interior design and furniture design. So what happened here was the stock market, as you know, crashed in 1929. And John D. Rockefeller Jr. held a 91 million 24 year lease on this lot in Midtown Manhattan. And he decided to build a complex of buildings standing for optimism and hope in this dark time. So they were, you know, this is when the start of the Great Depression. So RKO became a partner, um, which was making radio and movies under the uh, RKO or RCA title. And, um, the Rockefellers were the co-founders of Standard Oil, so they were the first Americans that were worth, or John D. Rockefeller was the first American to be worth more than a billion dollars, and he was controlling about 90% of the U.S. oil at its peak. So um, adjusted for inflation, that would be something like 350 billion today. I don't know, <laughs> very, very wealthy. So they used this uh, wealth to create this building that was, um, again, trying to celebrate different innovations and achievements in uh, humankind. So this is Donald Desky, who, along with Paul Frankel, really helped establish American Streamline Modern Style. Um, and this Radio City Music Hall, in his interiors that he designed for them, uh, is really called the Palace of American Art Deco. So he does tended to design furniture, which is very minimalist, geometric with repetitive lines um, and clear geometry using modern materials such as aluminum, chrome, uh, bakelite, that new, that um, early plastic. He studied at UC Berkeley and he also attended the 1925 Paris Exposition of Decorative Arts. So he also is known for designing the Tide logo which is still used today. So uh, again, that's a good design if you've, <laughs> you know, over a hundred years old and still going strong, or I guess about a hundred years old. So if you'll notice the details here, you see that sense of frozen motion of that um, light fixture hanging down and also the ziggurat, um, the zigzag patterns and the ziggurat shape around the door opening. And again, the mixture of materials that gives this kind of elegant yet geometric, um, again, not overly ornamental, just um, very, in this case, at the, for the time, very modern and stylish interior. This is a little plug for Art Deco lighting. I'm a big fan. Um, these were designed by Desky. And if you love Art Deco lighting, there's a place called Tap Lighting in Hillcrest on 6th Avenue. Um, sorry, this is a commercial. <laughs> but the owner, Tammy, goes to, all around in Paris and different places and gets old vintage lights and refurbishes them. So it's a pretty fun place to go. See some Art Deco fixtures if you're interested. So here's the famous ice skating rink at Radio City Music Hall. And uh, remember I said that during the Art Deco time, they also used Greek and Roman mythology 
as a allegory and theme. And here we have Prometheus delivering fire to mankind um, located above what becomes the skating rink in the winter time. Kind of ironic that it's got fire and ice. But anyway, um, you might have been seen this. It's used quite a bit in movies and such as like the movie Elf and so forth uh, has a scene at, set at the skating rink with Prometheus in the background. When we talk about streamline architecture, one place that shows quite a bit of Art Deco streamline is Miami uh, in Florida. And um, you'll see these kind of use of the curved walls, often with glass block, and that idea of uh, movement where the, and we saw that in uh, Wright's Johnson Wax building too, where these curves just kind of um, create this continuous flow around the building. So, so notice the frozen movement embodied in the uh, textile patterns that you're going to see on the next few, few slides. So whether it be water that's made to look geometric like you see here, or plants that are made to look kind of cubist and uh, geometric, or even those palm fronds where the uh, lines of the palm frond create a graphic pattern and makes the look more stiff versus natural, or things like lightning bolts and electrical current kind of themes are often used in the Art Deco textiles. So this room really embodies Art Deco style with the soffits, the steps in the ceiling, and that uh, geometric pattern within the soffits the curved lines and horizontal banding in the built-ins, and then notice the furniture with that um, swooping curve and use, the use of aluminum for the base of the table, and then the use of the baked light or the plastic, or in this case, lucite, um, that little two-tiered black and lucite table in the middle of the room. And if you'll notice the little settee with the rounded manchettes, so all of these add together um, a very Art Deco inspired space. That notion of making furniture more comfortable and accessible to people that was first put forth um, in the big way during the Biedermeier tradition in the early 1800s in Austria uh, gets revived here in the 1920s. So we have what's called Biedermeier of Revival in tables like you see here in this foyer. Um, which are using the styles of the M French Empire um, and then taken to create this more graphic, simple profile uh, inspired by the French Empire furniture. Art Deco stayed a popular style through the 1930s and 40s in um, residential design in you can see two examples of that in these bathrooms and these were common color palettes which were um, this kind of a celadon green uh, offset with black or pink offset with black and often some kind of a decorative tile band and often using a pedestal style sink so um, if you have one of these bathrooms please do not tear it out because they're historic but uh, anyway these uh, were commonly used in both the deco period and then moving forward through po uh, World War II. Another important figure to the movement was this man, Elil Saarinen, who's a Finnish architect and immigrated to the US, the US in 1925. And he was asked to design the campus for an academy called Cranbrook Educational Community. Uh, which became what they call the American Bauhaus. So he was a teacher there and was also the president, and he had a huge influence to designers such as Ray and Charles Eames, who were his students. Um, and so he was working in a more Art Deco style um, in his own apartments and his own residence um, for, uh, for the academy. But uh, let's take a look at some of his designs next. Cranbrook is in Michigan, and it's one of the leading 
graduate schools of architecture and design in the country. Um, and this um, had a big impact, like I said, on mid-century modern design. So not only were the Eames students his own son, Eero Saarinen, who's going to be a giant in mid-century modern design, and people like Harry Bertoia and other people we're going to study in the next few weeks, next few classes, um, were educated here. But Saarinen's philosophies of arts and crafts kind of filtered through what we call international style or modernist style really um, influenced these, these uh, burgeoning designers. You can see the geometric patterning of the deco style, the use of the exotic woods, and also the use of contrast. A lot of times you'll see kind of black and white or silver and black and those kind of contrasting colors and shapes used in art deco style. So notice that on the next slide where you see the dining room, where we have this kind of rounded shape of the ceiling um, soffits and coving playing off the roundness of the dining table and then playing off the more geometric forms in the sitting area, the more rectilinear forms. As I mentioned on the last slide, notice the rounded shapes in the dining area playing off the more rectilinear shapes in the seating area. And also this kind of stylized plant growth motif on the back of the chairs. So these side chairs, again, being designed by Saarinen uh, in that Art Deco style, as well as the ziggurat shaped niches and the use of the stainless steel light fixture. Okay, this is Jean-Michael Frank, who was born in Paris and tragically lost both his brothers in World War I. So because of that tragedy, his father committed suicide and his mother ended up in an asylum. And so after this uh, tragic family event, these tragic family events, Jean-Michael Frank started to travel the world. And so um, he traveled through the 1920s to the 1925, but he started teaching design in the 1930s at Parsons School of Design in Paris, where he and his students helped de develop the Parsons table, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But he's known for doing these very chic and elegant um, apartments for very wealthy clients. So he um, design apartments for people like Cole Porter and other um, notable people of the of the day. So again, if you look at this love seat, it looks quite ordinary to our eyes, but if you consider the furniture that had been created prior to this, it was quite radically different. So notice this slide in the next sofa and uh, the the square arm sofa. These are still forms that we're using that were created by Jean-Michael Frank um, in the 1920s and 30s. This is Frank's design for Cole Porter's apartment. Um, he would often use these kind of stylized classical motifs. So notice the pilasters uh, looking like ionic columns, but made from, you know, mirror and every, having everything look glossy and shiny is very um, indicative of Art Deco also. He was into minimalism, so he liked to have everything kind of clean and pared down. Uh, he was famous for seeing, handing the keys of the apartment to the client and saying, voila, my work here is done. Now you can start ruining it. <laughs> so I know the designers never lack for, for drama, that's for sure. But um, here's a few more looks at a few of his designs on the next slides. The Parsons table was um, a student project where Jean-Michael Frank, uh, teaching his students design in the 1930s, challenged his students to design a table so basic that it would retain its integrity, whether it was sheathed in gold leaf, mica, parchment, paint. Um, and this, they built a prototype and um, this has become a modern classic. So when started to, we're not quite sure, you know, if he was the first one to make this form, we, there's something similar that Marcel Brewer did in the 1923. Uh, but again, this was known as the Parsons table now because of that design project. Now, 
One last little note about Jean-Michael Frank. Tragically, he was also related, first cousins to Anne Frank. If you've ever read the diary of Anne Frank, uh, that's his family. And here we see Emile Jacques Ruhlman, who is considered uh, France's finest Art Deco designer. He was born in Paris and his father was a, had a decorating business. Um, and he was known to work in these very beautiful um, traditions of the French ebeniste, so to creating beautiful veneers with inlays. Um, they were also creating things like lighting and wall cover and other uh, designs for residential projects in Paris. Um, I think he has a very kind face. <laughs> I like, I like his, his kind eyes. But anyway, this is Emile Jacques Ruhlman. He, if you look at his sketches, you can see him experimenting with different line qualities and line textures to achieve a sense of texture and depth in his work. And um, I, as I mentioned before, one reason I encourage people sometimes to draw a design for their inspiration notebook is you can learn a lot about problem solving and design problem solving by sketching something out. And you can see Ruhlman problem solving you know, different designs in his furniture through these sketches. The Ruhlman furniture, along with other Art Deco furniture of the era, used a variety of woods, a lot of exotic woods, such as ebony and rosewood, and imported African woods, but also simple woods like pine and maple, a lot of lacquered pieces, so uh, using black lacquer was common, uh, mahogany walnut, and um, like I said, the other um, substance called chagrin, which is shark skin or, or um, stingray skin, which I'll show you an example of in a minute. But Ruhlman used these to create refined details. So notice the uh, little inlays that he used. He was often known for using these little embellishments, little dots of inlay. And um, he would use what's called ambonia wood to uh, the wood grain, you know, helping to embellish the piece. Another common detail for Ruhlman was these little refined lozenge shapes with the um, stinger stringing inlays and those little dots again of bone or pearl um, and then using a tassel like this for the pull of the piece and then notice the slender refined kind of um, almost animal paw leg but just very abstracted in his designs as well with the serpentine front. This one looks like it's made from mahogany. Notice the different profiles of the legs being used here, from, starting from the left, almost like a little column shape on the side um, storage cabinet, and then um, these curved legs on the chair, and then almost like a anthropomorphized human leg, looking like a leg, a thigh kind of coming up to a hip uh, on the desk, and then those kind of organic curves on the desk itself. And so Ruhlman was really known for these refined details and a beautiful sense of proportion and uh, organic flow, like you see here, but with the most elegant of materials being used. Oftentimes when um, you see this kind of gilding, they use a gesso base to create a smooth finish for the, the gold leaf and um, you know kind of carve that away and then create this uh, decorative effect. So it's very, you know, his furniture is also very whimsical. You can see this almost like a storybook look to the scene depicted here. And it also is reminiscent of those paintings, uh, the gold, stage paintings by Glimt, where he uses uh, geometric patterns that, um, you know, creates a very graphic effect in the art. You can see the use of forms from the past in the Deco period, such as the Selicurilia stool or the Dante style uh, curved X, and then uh, different inspirations from 
the past furniture seen on these next few slides in this kind of Greco-Roman revival style. Okay, notice the use of what's called chagrin on this particular piece. And that's this uh, shark skin or basically stingray skin. It's something that had been used in um, the Middle East actually for centuries, but um, art deco designers and particularly in French art deco designers brought it back as a, a way to clad the furniture and it gives it this kind of soft um, textured look. And uh, you can see that well, poor stingrays, but anyway, you can see that combined with the burling of the wood to create these kind of exotic textures, even though the piece itself is very simple. Here's another example of using shark skin on the back of the chair. Um, this chair by Rousseau was uh, Rousseau was one of the most prolific designers of the Art Deco period, but examples of his work are very rare. Um, this is some of the work that was displayed in Paris during the 1920s, and he typically used kind of stylized leaves, flower petals, and these kind of sunray patterns seen on these chairs were some of the common motifs, but um, using the shark skin, um, dyed green and natural gray, um, these kind of contrasting bands, created the sunburst pattern, which um, was a favorite for Art Deco designers. I'll leave you with this whimsical design by André Gaulle um, from 1925, Chiffonier Anthropomique, Anthropomique <laughs> easy for me to say. Uh, pink and gray um, is a common palette here, but it's uh, also the chagrin, the shark skin or stingray skin. And um, it means anthropomorphized, so it's meant to look like a human. You can see the kind of the hips and the curves and the legs of the piece. So if you're seeing Beauty and the Beast, it reminds me of uh, the furniture coming to life, uh, like the furniture in that film. But anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed your tour through Art Deco, and uh, we'll pick up with some mid-century, 20th century modernism next class.